The Auburn Tigers made an absolute statement on Wednesday evening. They still belong in college basketball's upper echelon. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Andy Patton. Today, we got a fantastic show covering a variety of different things all going on in college basketball. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Folks, new customers who join today, you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. We're going to talk about Chris Holtman getting the axe at Ohio State, a couple of candidates to potentially take over for the Buckeyes in the future. We'll talk about that. We're also going to hear from Jackson Holzer, the new host of the Locked On Syracuse podcast, getting his thoughts on Tuesday's game when Syracuse beat North Carolina, the thoughts on how Red Autry has done as the new head coach for Syracuse so far this season. We're going to get to all that, but... There are four games from Wednesday that I want to talk about first before we get into those conversations. We're going to start with a pair of games in the SEC Auburn, our number 11th ranked team on the Lockdown College Basketball Top 25. They made themselves an absolute statement victory over South Carolina, who we had ranked 13th. This was an evenly matched game, according to most, according to the AP poll, our poll. Auburn was at home, and Bruce Pearl's team didn't even make this thing a contest. 50-point victory for Auburn over South Carolina. The Tigers shot 61% from the field. They shot 60% from three, 12 of 20 from distance. They had 22 assists and just seven turnovers in this game. Meanwhile, for South Carolina, five assists and 13 turnovers, a massive difference. This was a huge, like we said, statement victory for Auburn. They've had their, their ups and downs. They were a darling team about a month ago when they had a lot of momentum going for them. They'd been blowing out everybody they'd been playing, but they hadn't really been tested. And then when they started getting tested, they didn't pass. It took them a while to pick up their first quad one victory, which they got against Ole Miss. They needed to establish that they could beat the better teams in the SEC and that they weren't just going to continue getting by by pounding bad teams. South Carolina is not a bad team. There's a reason we had them ranked 13th. There's a reason the eight people has them in the top 20. And yes, in the preseason, they weren't considered a very good team, but Lamont Paris has done a very good job with that team. They've beat Kentucky. They've beat Tennessee. They've established themselves as one of the better teams in the SEC. And Auburn made them look silly on Wednesday night. Huge, huge hat tip to Bruce Pearl and that team. They really cemented themselves as like, hey, we're not just a team that's beaten up on bad teams. We're not just a team that's one of the three or four good teams in the SEC. We deserve to be in that conversation. We deserve to be in that top 10, top eight, top five type conversation. Not sure they're getting all the way there just because of this victory, but it certainly doesn't hurt. And they did it with their depth. Jalen Williams, 23 points on 8 of 11 shooting. Very efficient from him. Jani Broom, 21 points. He shot 4 of 5 from 3. When your big man's stepping out and shooting 80% from distance, there's just not a whole lot of ways that you're going to not find a way to get a W in that instance. Auburn and South Carolina now tied at 9-3 and three in the SEC. They're both a half game back from Alabama. And they both have a half game on Tennessee, who also – Picked up a very big victory on Wednesday evening. Tennessee, number eight ranked team in our poll. They beat Arkansas. It wasn't quite as dominant as the win for South Carolina. There are not too many 50-point victories that go on in college basketball, but Tennessee was only up six at halftime in this game. 46 to 40 was the score. They ended up outscoring Arkansas 46 to 23 in the second half, coasting to an easy victory. Jonas Adu, 23 points and 12 boards in this one. He shot 11 of 14 from the field. And that kind of highlights one of the many problems that Arkansas has been having this year. But in particular, they just don't have a lot of front court depth. They don't have a lot of rim protection. They're not really slowing down any bigs. And that's a problem in the SEC. There are a lot of really talented big men in this conference. And if you don't have anybody who can push them around, who can be an enforcer, who can play that role, you're going to struggle. And Jonas Adu absolutely took advantage of that. Dalton Connect had a great game as well. I think he had 22 in this one. But Arkansas not stopping anybody in the paint. They also turned the ball over 15 times and shot 38% from the field. It's not going to get it done. Three and eight now 
in the SEC. Meanwhile, like we said, Tennessee eight and three, one game off of Alabama, half game back of both South Carolina and Auburn. It is a battle between those four teams right now at the top of the SEC. There's a lot of teams that are close, but it feels like those four teams, and especially the way Auburn just took care of South Carolina, it really feels like this thing might come down between Alabama, Auburn, and Tennessee, uh, and both Tennessee and Auburn took care of business on Wednesday evening. I want to move on to a couple other games outside the SEC, but absolutely within the bubble conversation. We got Miami who fell further and further out of that bubble conversation with a 17-point loss to Clemson. The Tigers took care of business in their way, 20 points from Chase Hunter, 18 from Joe Girard. They shot 43% from three, 13 of 30, 33 33-point attempts for Clemson, knocked down 13 of them. For Miami, Norchad O'Meara had a nice game, 18 and 12, but Nigel Pack, for the two out of his last three games, he has not made a single field goal. He was 0 of 8 with just two points against Virginia. Then he had 20 points against North Carolina. And then he went 0 of 7 in this game. Did not even score. When your starting point guard is just giving you nothing in two of his last three games, there's just not a lot that you're able to do if you're Miami. At this point, with the way Miami's season has gone, it's tournament or bust. There is no debate about it. They have to win the ACC tournament. For a team that's been to the, that was in the final four last year, back to back elite eights, this team has taken a very precipitous fall. Meanwhile, for Clemson, after a lot of conversation we have had about, oh, you know, Clemson's Clemsoning again. They're going to, they're struggling in the ACC after a great non conference. They're going to push themselves out of the bubble conversation. That has not been the case. Clemson struggled to start ACC play, but they have picked up a handful of big victories and have avoided some bad losses for the last couple of weeks. And now they feel much more firmly established as a team that is going to get an at large bid in the NCAA tournament. A lot could still change. But right now, Clemson has continued to put themselves in a much safer position as we get closer and closer to March. Final game from uh, from Wednesday, excuse me, that we wanted to talk about. Seton Hall just obliterated Xavier. Really con- not, not startling that they won. They were the favored team here, but really just took it to them. 47 to 25 was a score at halftime. I believe it was 31 to 11 at one point in this game. And they ended up winning by 18, 88 to 70, but just never really, never really gave Xavier a chance. In this one, Kadari Richmond, what an incredible game from him. 20 points, 13 assists, eight rebounds, and a pair of steals. He was nine of 18 from the field. He had just one turnover. 13 assists and one turnover with 20 points. Two boards off of a triple-double. Really nice performance from Seton Hall. They continue to establish themselves as the fourth best team in the Big East behind, of course, Marquette, or excuse me, UConn Marquette and Creighton UConn uh, took care of DePaul on Wednesday as well. Not that we're particularly surprised by that result, but Seton Hall continues to establish themselves as that top team. Meanwhile, for Xavier, this was a chance to pick up an upset victory to move themselves a little farther into the standings of the Big East, but also to potentially kind of get more comfortable on the bubble. And they didn't get that opportunity or they wasted that opportunity, I should say. Now 7-7 seven and seven in Big East play, 13-12 and 12 overall, and they got some work to do if they want to find themselves back in the NCAA tournament. They were a three-seed last year. Granted, they lost a lot of talent and been dealing with some preseason injuries, but this is a rough spot for Sean Miller's team to be, and they, like I said, they got some work to do if they want to find themselves back in the big dance. Last game, got to shout out the Detroit Mercy. First win of the year in the Horizon League. They are now 1-26 and after beating IUPUI on Wednesday evening, leaving Mississippi Valley State out of the SWAC as the only remaining winless team in college basketball. Shout out Detroit for getting that first W. All right, well, Chris Holtman is out at Ohio State. Who are some candidates who could replace him? What are some other Big Ten coaches that could be out the door after this season? We're going to get to all of that. I wanted to tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 in your pocket if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players, college players, and teams with quick bets, live games, saving game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Right now, the final four odds, UConn and Purdue, both at plus 150 highest odds. We also have Houston at plus 210, the Wildcats of Arizona at plus 240, Tennessee following them at plus 330, and then Iowa State, first top second team out of the Big 12, they are at plus 380. If you want to get in on that action, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, 
an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, folks, still Andy Patton here, still Locked On College Basketball Podcast, switching gears a bit to talk about the big news out of the Big Ten. Chris Holtman, head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes, he is out the door officially. And this is a surprise, not just because of Holtman's success in his first couple of years coaching in Columbus, but because just a week and a half ago or so in early February, the athletic director for Ohio State, Gene Smith, had a press release where he said he was going to wait until the end of the season to make a decision on whether to keep or retain coach Chris Holtman going forward. It's kind of a reminder for those of you who, who play fantasy baseball or follow the MLB. If a coach gives confidence in their closer, we're going to keep this guy in the closing role. He's going to be our ninth inning guy. That is almost a universal sign to go pick up whoever's pitching in the eighth inning. And that's kind of what this felt like here of, Hey, as soon as we express some confidence hey, we're going to keep this guy. We're not planning to make a move. That's kind of an indication that, that maybe the walls are starting to crumble a little bit. And for Coach Holtman, Ohio State has lost nine of their last 11 games. And at this point, I think they just had to make a decision. They had to make a move. Smith wanted to wait until the end of the year. I don't think he was lying about saying that was his plan. It was his plan. But plans change, and sometimes that happens. It's a little surprising to see this happen after a road loss to Wisconsin, it's not really in the grand scheme of the losses that you can take in the Big Ten. That's one of the better ones. Wisconsin has obviously been struggling significantly, having had lost four games in a row prior to that game over Ohio State. But I think it was just that was just the breaking point. Enough was enough. Ohio State 14 and 11 on the year, but only four and 10 in the Big Ten. The only team they are ahead of in the standings is Michigan, who is in a complete dumpster fire of a situation right now and with Jawan Howard and everything that has gone on over there. But Ohio State, I mean, this is a team that was went to four straight NCAA tournaments after they hired Holtman. He never led them out of the first round, which I think is part of the frustration here is like, hey, even at his best, even in the best years that he gave Ohio State, this team wasn't making a real push. They were getting into the tournament. They were developing highly talented players, putting them in the NBA, but they weren't getting into that second weekend. They weren't making pushes for Sweet 16s, for Elite Eight, for anything like that. And then you tack on a really rough season this year, a 4-10 and 10 record in the Big Ten. Being second to last in the Big Ten is just not a place Ohio State is comfortable. It's not a place they're familiar. It's not a place that they want to be. And so they made this move. Holtman's still young. He's still had a lot of success. He's going to land on his feet. I'm not sure where. We'll see how this coaching carousel shakes out, but I'd be very surprised if he doesn't land a head coaching job somewhere, assuming that's what he wants to continue to do. But there are a lot of candidates already coming to mind who make sense as potential replacements for Holtman at Ohio State. The coaching carousel is just in its infancy. Holtman's the second power six head coach to lose his job in the middle of the season following Tony Stubblefield. At DePaul, there are a handful of other jobs we expect will likely be open at the end of the year. Kenny Payne at Louisville is a likely one, although we will see if that actually comes to fruition. Certainly there are other coaches who could retire. There are other coaches who will probably lose their jobs. We'll in fact talk about a few other Big Ten potential job openings that could happen. But here are the five candidates that came to mind for me, and we have a bonus one. So it's six, technically, that I think could make some sense because of some Midwest connections, maybe some Ohio State connections, success on the basketball court. They're all former or current head coaches right now uh, that I think could make some sense for Ohio State. Uh, number one is Pat Kelsey. Pat Kelsey has been at Charleston for a very long time. Uh, obvious connections uh, in the area, uh, in the Midwest area. And Charleston has been really good. He was kind of a really hot topic very recently uh, when they had that really gr great season last year, lost to San Diego State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. But Kelsey has connections to Ohio. And I think there's a kind of a real push, some real momentum for that potentially being uh, the new person to take over. I think Kelsey's 48. Uh, he's, he's under 50. So he'd be somebody that Ohio State could bring in and hopefully really hold on to for a long time. They have the money. They have the capital to not really risk losing him to another program. He's probably not going to go to Ohio State and then jump somewhere else. You never say never if he leaves Ohio State to multiple Elite Eights and then Calipari retires in five years and Kentucky comes calling. You know, that's going to be a tough, tough thing for him to turn down if that situation comes to fruition, but more than likely, Kelsey's the kind of coach that Ohio State could bring in and potentially kind of mold into a long-time, long-term coach for them, provided, of course, that he has some success. 
A lot of those same things can be said for Wes Miller, the head coach at Cincinnati and the Bearcats right now. Now, Miller's a little bit tougher to pull away. Char you're hiring Kelsey out of Charleston, uh, a mid-major program, a mid-major conference, trying to pull Wes Miller away from Cincinnati after their first year in the Big 12, the best hands down basketball conference in the country might be a little bit trickier, but there is more money, more resources, more boosters at Ohio state than there is at Cincinnati. There's just, there's no debate about that. There's no conversation that needs to be had there. That is the reality. Miller obviously has connections in Ohio. He has connections in the Midwest. He also has connections in Carolina. He's a North Carolina guy, Wake Forest. I think his dad was a, is, is a booster at Wake Forest. So he's got connections in some recruiting hotbed areas. He's also got connections in the Midwest. He's a young coach. He's had a ton of success at UNC Greensboro. Now he's having success at Cincinnati. They struggled a little bit, but they're better than people expected them to be in their first year in the Big 12. I think Wes Miller is going to be one of the most highly sought after coaching candidates, this, this carousel. And Ohio State's going to be in a really good position to potentially land him because of those connections in the Midwest. A couple of coaches out of the Missouri Valley Conference we want to talk about here. I think that's a conference that could have quite a few coaching changes happening. Uh, we got Darian DeVries at Drake and Josh Schertz at Indiana State. Darian DeVries has worked, he was at Creighton as an assistant coach. He worked under both Dana Altman, the head coach at Oregon, and Greg McDermott, who is still, of course, the head coach at Creighton. He has familiarity with high-level coaches. He's been in around the, the Midwest area coaching successfully. Drake has been fantastic for four or five seasons now. The main question with DeVries is his son, Tucker DeVries, currently plays at Drake. He's averaging about 21 points per game. DeVries is a junior. If he wants to finish out his career at Drake, it makes sense for Coach Darian to stay at Drake for another season. But it could also be a package deal. The possibility of Darian going to coach at Ohio State and Tucker, who would be a phenomenal fit for a Big Ten school the way he is playing, that could be a really fruitful uh, for whatever team tries to hire Darian or is successful. That's, again, predicated on Tucker wanting to transfer. If he wants to stay then I think Darian's probably going to be there for another year, maybe look for that coaching carousel after his son graduates, assuming Drake continues to be successful. For Josh Schertz at Indiana State, he was a longtime Division II coach, uh, comes up to Division I level, has had a ton of success. Indiana State ranked for the first time since Larry Bird was a student there, was a player there. Uh, of course, Indiana State did just lose to Illinois State right after getting into the ranking, still 22-4 and four on the season. Schertz doesn't have as many obvious Midwest connections outside of, of course, being at Indiana State for the last few years, but he's a young coach and he has been a winning, winning, winning coach everywhere that he has been. And I think he's going to be another hot commodity on that trail uh, with the success Indiana State is happening. And then finally, Will Wade. Got to talk about Will Wade, right? Success at VCU, tremendous success at LSU. Obviously, there is some baggage with Will Wade with some of the recruiting stuff. He has served his 10-game suspension to start his season at McNeese, and once he came back out, guess what? McNeese is winning basketball games and winning and winning and winning because Will Wade is a winner. Regardless of what you think about him individually, about some of the recruiting stuff that happened, Will Wade wins basketball games. He is going to be highly sought after. There is un no doubt about that. He has won games at the Power 6 level. He has won games in the SEC. The other coaches on this list can't say that, not consistently at least. Wes Miller has won games in the Big 12, but this is his first year. For Will Wade, he is going to be pursued. He still has a show cause through 24-25, so maybe there's another year that people wait, but Will Wade is going to get pursued, and Ohio State would be stupid to not at least put a phone call in and consider it. Those are my five. My, my honorable mention is Chris Mack. Chris Mack, of course, former Louisville head coach, out of coaching, has said that maybe after taking a year off, he would get back in. I could see Ohio State at least giving him a phone call there, but wanted to focus on the five coaches that I think, uh, the five current head coaches who I think make some sense for Ohio State. And we mentioned it, and I'll go over it briefly, a couple other programs that I think could be looking. What about Indiana? Is Mike Woodson going to last the rest of the year? This team has had a very disappointing season, but at the end of the day, Woodson has had success previously. Some people think, well, now that Trace Jackson Davis is gone, can he prove he can still coach? He brought in talented players. McKenzie Mbaka was a top 10 recruit. Kalel Ware was one of the most promising players in the portal, but it hasn't translated to success. I suspect Woodson will get a little bit longer leash, but I know that fan base is frustrated. 
Ben Johnson at Minnesota is a little bit farther on my radar right now. Minnesota six and six in the Big Ten, so that's probably exceeding or at least at expectation for where you'd expect the Golden Gophers to be. So I don't think that they're going to be chomping at the bit to let him go necessarily. But I do think he's on his seat's a little warm. Let's put it that way. And then Jawan Howard. There's just it's hard for me to imagine Jawan Howard stays the head coach of the Michigan, Michigan Wolverines after this year. There's so many off the court dramatic problems. There's on the court issues, uh, just from his sideline antics, there's suspension issues that are very kind of weird and, and hard to understand. Uh, there's, and they're not winning basketball games. I mean, there's there's not really any redeeming qualities at this point. I'm not saying Juwan Howard's like a terrible person or anything, but he's not leading this program in any direction that is positive. There's not a lot to hang your hat on the way Michigan basketball is going right now. So. I would be very surprised if he kept his job. That means there's as many as four potential Big Ten job openings, at least two most likely, potentially three or four. Uh, it should be a very interesting coaching carousel all across college basketball, but definitely including the Big Ten as well. We're going to close out the show today talking to Jackson Holzer, the host, the new host of Locked on Syracuse. We're going to discuss the Oranges win over Carolina back on Tuesday. We're also going to talk about the job Red Autry has done so far. All that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Folks, we are just under a month away from most of the college basketball conference tournaments. And if you don't have tickets, but your team is making a big run, you should use Game Time because it is the great place to get last minute tickets so you don't have to miss out on all the excitement. Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all of the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, GameTime is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind when you make your purchase. There's a fun one. With GameTime's done zone deals, you pick the section and GameTime picks the seats for big time savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with GameTime, where you can buy tickets in seconds with just two quick taps. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's $20 off your first purchase at game time with promo code locked on terms do apply. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Well, I'm thrilled to be joined to close out today's show with Jackson Holzer, the new host of the Locked On Syracuse podcast. We're going to discuss Syracuse's big win over Carolina on Tuesday. Also, the job that Red Autry has done in his first year as the head coach with the Orange. Jackson, first of all, welcome to the network. I know you got your first show coming up next week for Syracuse, but what a time to be taken over this show, taken over this program. A huge win for Red Autry and the Q and Cuse on Tuesday night against North Carolina. First win over a top 10 team since 2019 and feels like a really promising sign of things to come under Coach Autry. Yeah, Andy, I wish I could be starting today, uh, yeah. but unfortunately <laughs> it won't be until a week from now. It was definitely an exciting game. Syracuse finally did what I've been asking them to do for a very long time, which is beat a team that they are not better than. Mm -hmm. Like, finally do it. Because, And I'm not counting the NCAA tournament when, you know, that's March madness. It's March. Anything happens. You mentioned it. First win against a top 10 team since 2019. I remember that one. It was a road one at Duke against yeah. the Zion, R.J. Barrett, Cam Reddish team, right? Cam Reddish was on that team, right? Yep, yep. 95, 91 in overtime. Didn't think it'd take another five years, but <laughs> glad it finally happened. Yeah, I, as uh, somebody who uh, also hosts the Locked On Zags podcast, I very vividly remember that Duke team because Gonzaga got them uh, in the Maui Invitational Championship. That was quite a Duke team for for Syracuse to beat in that year. And uh, what we saw from this Cuse team here in 2024 was kind of what we expected. If, if Syracuse is going to pull off this kind of upset, if they're going to beat this caliber of team, it's going to need to be because both of those guards go absolutely crazy. And that's what happened. Judah Mintz, J.J. Starling both had phenomenal games. I think they were something like 17 of 26 combined from the field, had 48 of Syracuse's points. And for a, a team that is lacking some depth right now with the McLeod injury, with some suspensions, other injuries, this team has only played seven guys in this game against North Carolina, a team that has more depth and has more different ways. They're, they're usually capable of beating you with R.J. Davis playing the way he's playing with Baycott and Ingram in the front court. And yet Syracuse finds a way because of those two guards to to really finish off this team, to, to kind of put themselves in a position to really finish off the season in a strong note. And, and what have you kind of seen from 
the backcourt in particular, and maybe from coaches, Coach Autry's coaching style that has kind of allowed this team to, to be able to pull off a kind of upset like this? So regarding the backcourt, J.J. Starling was one of, if not the top transfer player mm -hmm. uh, last season, and he was the first guy that Coach Autry got. So it was a great start. And this is, I think, what a lot of Syracuse fans, including myself, envisioned when J.J. Starling came here. We all know, based on last season and how Judah has played so far, how good Judah Mintz is. Mm -hmm. He's a potential NBA prospect. You can see him on mock drafts, probably a second-ish, second-round-ish pick if he were to declare. Starling came into the season, though, and he was really struggling. He, he couldn't hit. He, he couldn't hit a shot to save his life. He couldn't. He... But he was coming off shoulder surgery, and he kind of had a hitch in his shot. And lately, he's making everything. Even when he's taking wild shots, like at the end of this game, I think the turning point of the game was when he hit that 30-footer from the left wing, and he banks it in. Yeah, It was just one of those, everything is just going right. I mean, Syracuse is a team, Andy, shot 63% from the floor <laughs> against North Carolina. Yeah. And you mentioned lack of depth, and they only played seven players. Andy, they only had eight scholarship players dressed. <laughs> eight scholarship players. Yeah. One of those is, is William Patterson. You probably don't know who he is, and that's okay, because if you look him up on Google, you mm -hmm. probably won't find any information on him. He was the only freshman recruit and hasn't seen the floor yet this year. So they're running with seven guys. It was one of those wins – Ultimately, where in a season that has had lots of downs, mm -hmm. you know, people have said up and down, but it's mostly been downs. That you can look back on this game and say, maybe this program is finally heading in the right direction. As far as, you know, making the NCAA tournament, I know people want to start talking about that. They're on the NIT bubble. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's almost no chance they make the tournament barring they win the conference itself, right. which of course – it's happened before. Georgetown did it a couple years ago. But it's one of those games where, you know, Syracuse, next season, we can look back on this game and say, you know what? They can do it. They can get back to the glory days where this is a program that's consistently in the top 10, top 15 national polls, making the tournament with ease, with final four expectations. I got a lot of flack about a week ago because I said that, my expectation or my standard for this program is the final four. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this team used to be in March madness, a top five seed year yeah. in and year out. And if you're a top five seed in March madness, you're, you do locked on Gonzaga, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in that, if you're in that area, mm -hmm. the standard is the final four at that point, yep. whether you live up to it or not is, is a whole different discussion. But the standard when you're that good of a team in the regular season is, can you make the final four? Mm -hmm. I've held Syracuse to that standard even during these dark years. So hopefully this game is the one where we can look back on and say, this was the turning point of the program. And not, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't think Syracuse is, is getting into the dance this year unless they win that ACC tournament. But this win not only can be a turning point for them going forward of, of like, hey, this is when Autry kind of, you know, won the fan base over and started to turn things around. But there's a, there's a real chance that this is a really good momentum push for just the rest of the regular season. Syracuse does not have a particularly difficult schedule for the rest of the year. Part of that is the simple fact that the ACC is just – pretty down this year outside of the top couple of teams. Uh, but their next couple games are road games at Georgia Tech and NC State. Those are both winnable games, even on the road. They got home games against Notre Dame and Virginia Tech, certainly both winnable games there. And then road games at Louisville and Clemson. Obviously, that Clemson one is a particularly difficult one, but that's the only game that stands out of like, hey, that's definitely a game Syracuse is not favored and is probably going to have a hard time picking up a W. But you look at the schedule here, you go five and one, you go four and two to end the season after that North Carolina win. I mean, yeah, it's not going to lead you all of a sudden into being on the NCAA tournament bubble. I don't think that that's a, a likely scenario, but it certainly makes the fan base. It makes the kind of people who are maybe a little apprehensive about bringing in a coach who had so much familiarity with Bayheim. Is it going to be more of the same? Like, what's it going to look like next year? I would imagine that that a four, two, five and one finish to the year uh, after this Carolina win is probably going to bring a lot of goodwill in terms of just the fan base and, and how people are feeling about this program going forward. Yeah, that that's exactly my point that I'm making. They, they realistically 
should at least go four and two to end the regular season. At yeah. least. I think we can all acknowledge that while I don't think Clemson's that ver- that good, mm-hmm. I really don't, mm-hmm. that still going on the road, mm-hmm. they're probably not going to win that game. Yeah, And then I can easily see Syracuse laying a stinker in the other ones, even though they should probably win all of them. Mm-hmm. I don't know which one it would be. Yeah. But if you can end the year four and two, and if you include the end North Carolina game five and two, mm-hmm. make a little run in the ACC tournament, maybe win two games. Yeah. Dare I say win two games in the tournament. There's hope for next year, right? Yeah. There's, okay, it's not all doom and gloom. Perhaps players then want to stay, the best ones who need to stay, quite frankly. I think Syracuse needs Judah Mintz next year. Mm-hmm. They need Starling to stay next year. And probably Starling's not going anywhere because I don't think he's good enough for NBA yet. And he just transferred, so he's not going to do that. But Mintz in particular, would he come back? Uh, Chris Bell has been very good lately. Will he come back and be that support piece? Copeland, probably. Brown as well. All those guys. And then what I said, when I because I, I, I went on Locked on ECC, I think, last week, mm-hmm. I said – they have Donnie Freeman coming in. He's a five-star recruit. Yep. He's one of the best recruits this program has had in the last 10 years. Whether he hits or not, that's what he is built to be right now. And then if you can couple that with an awesome transfer class, I'm talking about getting like real dudes in here. Remember when Zach Eady entered the transfer portal? I'm talking like that. <laughs> like I'm not saying Zach Eady in particular, but yeah. getting like the best guys. That's where the momentum can really start for Syracuse. It's not there yet, but when you beat North Carolina, everyone's really happy right now. And if they do somehow, if they, not somehow, if they do turn this thing around mm-hmm. and become a dominant team next season, we're going to look back on this game that happened on February 13th, 2024, and say this was the moment that Coach Autry laid his footprint on this team and it became a new era of dominance of Syracuse basketball. Big things ahead for Syracuse. Big things ahead for Locked On Syracuse as well. Check it out next week when Jackson goes live with the first couple episodes. Jackson, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Looking forward to more interaction as this Cuse team continues to to build back towards a, a bright future. Thank you, Andy. I really appreciate it. All right, that's going to wrap it up today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I want to thank all of you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remind you to join us on our Discord channel if you have not done so yet. Also, subscribe on YouTube. Very much appreciate those of you who have already done so. Isaac and I will be back on Friday getting you ready for another epic weekend of college basketball games as we get closer and closer to March. Until then, though, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, and we'll be back on Friday. Peace out.